Okay, well, um, I want to begin really with the Second World War and with the great Archbishop William Temple. Um, it's well known that uh, William Temple uh, was the great architect of the welfare state. Uh, he wrote his bestseller called Christianity and Social Order at the beginning of, of, of the war. And what that book was about was about really rebuilding society after the war was over. over. But he shied away from anything to do with sex and personal relationships. Perhaps it was his gout. But there were some who began to dream of what might sex might look like in the future. What would sex look like in the society that was to be rebuilt uh, after the Second World War? And most fascinating to me of all the characters then was a man called Kenneth Ingram. Uh, he published a book at the beginning of the war called Sex, Morality, Tomorrow. Uh, he'd been, earlier on in his career, he'd been a prominent Anglo-Catholic layman. Uh, he'd written the Church Scouts prayer book in the First World War, and later he became a socialist in the early 1920s. Um, but gradually he moved away from uh, his Anglo-Catholicism towards a much more liberal uh, position uh, with regard to the church and theology. And that was also accompanied by the acceptance of his own homosexuality. Sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, now, through the uh, 1920s and 1930s, he'd written a lot on the importance of understanding same-sex desire and championed the idea of what he called homogenic love. I should say, as we go through the lecture, there may be some uh, rather unfamiliar words, and some of them certainly wouldn't be used nowadays, but I'll try and use the words that were used at the time. Now, he talked about homogenic love, uh, and for him, that meant love as well for younger men and for boys. Again, that was very common at the time. But he was clear that even where it was intimate, it should never involve any sexual expression. In the end, and drawing on current psychological theory of the time, Ingram felt the human race would return to its true nature. And that was understood by very many psychologists at the time as a bisexual species uh, from which it's come. Now, by the time of Sex Morality Tomorrow, in the beginning of the First World War, his opinions had changed quite significantly. And the fact that he was writing about the future was, I think, rather important. And like many others, he was already thinking about post-war reconstruction. And I guess that allowed him a degree of latitude in exercising the powers of his imagination. Any attempt to deal with the problems of sex life, he said, must therefore take into account a radically altered society, which may produce an outlook on sex very different from that with which we are familiar. I propose to indicate what I believe will happen. Now, Ingram had come to see his earlier understanding of Christianity as a type of legalistic moralism and began to explore the idea that a loving relationship outside marriage could be preferable to a loveless relationship within marriage, and that included uh, relationships between people of the same sex. There were, he thought, far more homosexuals than sociologists had recognised, and homosexual practice appeared to be on the increase. This is during the blackout. Now, it wasn't simply restricted to what he called the effeminate male or masculine female, but was also common among men of what he called the virile military type. Homosexuality may be contrary to the intention of nature, he said, but was very normal which meant that the sex morality of the future will, adapt to, it will need to adapt itself so that the homosexual can reveal his nature as freely as if he were to acknowledge that he were left-handed or colourblind. It was simply one of those things. Such an acknowledgement would allow the archaic laws with their potential for blackmail to be reformed and for homosexuals to lead a happy and fulfilled life. So Ingram was keen to see homosexuality as what he called a variety of sexual temperament, which has its natural place and its part to play in human affairs. Most homosexual relationships, he felt, were based on love and should be allowed to flourish in the public rather than simply the private sphere. He said the architecture of human society requires the existence of different types. So there was consequently little to regret in being homosexual. Now, while he recognised that some homosexuals would gather in rather exotic queer groups, he felt that this was an act of solidarity that was provoked at the time by being the victims of universal odium. 
sex, he felt, was not simply about procreation, but was fundamentally about what he called the love relationship, which meant that homosexuality can no more be condemned than contraception. Now, in the extraordinary final chapter of the book, which was called Bisexuality, which meant something rather different at the time, Ingram outlined a future in which there would be an equalization in relationships so that men and women would be equal partners and the love experience would not be conditioned solely by a sense of sex differentiation. When I fall in love, I fall in love with a person. The attachment is personal, not radically sexual. Now, although he continued to use the bisexual term bisexual to describe that kind of approach, he departed from his earlier biological explanation, which saw human beings as a blend of the masculine and feminine. So you could be a male homosexual without any particular blend. Instead, he come to see homosexuality just as a description of an identity that was no longer based entirely on supposed feminine or masculine characteristics existing in a different relationship, but instead simply on the object of desire. Who do we fancy? Relationships were to be validated by an equality between the parties and by what he called the love motif, rather than by any legal solemn, solemnization. So can love, he said, under any circumstances be immoral? If the love is mutual and the desire for consummation is mutual, on what moral principle, as distinct from legalistic regulations, can the sexual consummation be evil? The real problem is to solve, to solve is the nature of love. And as he contemplated the future of sexual morality, so he came to be an advocate of non-domination and equality in relationships between male men, women, men, men, women, women, which meant a degree of sexual diversity and pluralism. Now, this change of understanding allowed him to say, as he said, the love motif is the only legitimate basis on which a positive sexual morality is likely to be built. Wherever there is love, wherever the desire is genuinely mutual, there can be no immorality in sex. So he concludes, love, and usually love of the most complete kind, is the substance of the vast majority of homosexual relationships, and where love is sincerely mutual, it is immoral to devalue it. Ingram's general call for liberalization of homosexual relations was obviously, I think, likely to provoke those who sought to limit sexual relations to those within a monogamous marriage. And it must be said, perhaps all the work that went into LLF would have been better just by uh, sending round a copy of uh, Ingram's book to all the members of General Synod. Anyway, Ingram's approach was certainly very different from the approach taken by lots of the other uh, Christian moralists of his day. So for instance, Leonard Hodgson, who was Regis Professor of uh, Divinity in Oxford, offered a far more traditional account against homosexual relations in his Christian teaching about sex. It was published in 1942. Like most people at the time, he felt that homosexual activity went against the order of creation on the grounds that it made unnatural use of organs not designed to complement each other. That's the usual argument. Consequently, the only option for homosexuals, because things didn't really fit, should be celibacy. And this places, he said, a specially severe demand for self-sacrifice upon those who are naturally homosexual, for it calls upon them to accept the inevitable cross of perpetual celibacy. Now, Ingram's book, attracted substantial reaction from the general public and in turn the church hierarchy, particularly uh, William Temple, grew rather anxious. A certain Miss Lettuce A. McMunn, for instance, wrote to Temple claiming that the book contained pernicious stuff which was quite inappropriate to inflict on the young people of England, particularly during wartime. Now Ingram uh, was asked by the Archbishop to withdraw the book on the grounds that it might provoke disagreement and disunity among those promoting reform, uh, post-war reform, on Christian lines. Temple thought the best tactic would actually be to minimise publicity, no Twitter in those days, so that the book would disappear from the public gaze with little discussion. In the event, Ingram was persuaded to issue no further edition on the grounds of the damage this might inflict on the reforming movement rather more generally. 
wartime circumstances, it would seem meant that the book, which was by far the most radical statement by a Christian thinker for an awfully long period, had little immediate effect. Now, where did this all go? What was happening during the war? I think it's feasible that Ingram's book, along with his later contribution to the debate, which was called Christianity and Sexual Morality, helped inform the general change of tone that began to emerge in the public discussion from the end of the war right up until the 1950s. And it should also be noted that the war itself uh, saw a marked increase in homosexual activity. It was partly lots of people called up for service, but it was also the black blackout being widely welcomed uh, by homosexuals out of sight uh, was very useful. Uh, even so, there were large numbers of courts martial for indecency between males. By the 1950s, some of the radical ideas that had been outlined by authors such as Ingram, particularly the acceptance of homosexuality as a natural condition, like, like being left-handed, were becoming increasingly widespread among a number of thinkers, including a large number of churchmen, even if almost all of them stop short of condoning physical same-sex relationships among Christians, at least. Now, what's perhaps most striking in the post-war period is that the Church of England Church Assembly in November 1957 passed a motion that called for the decriminalisation of homosexuality that had been proposed in the Wolfenden Report of that same year. So I think there's an element of truth in the claim that in some ways the Church of England could be regarded as a contributing factor in the rise of the permissive society. So writing in 1970, one secular scholar wrote, there is a remarkable and usually unnoticed role of the Church of England as an active agent of change. In the last 15 years or so, uh, since its publications on such issues as homosexuality, abortion and illegitimacy have been well informed and judicious, essential reading for students and politicians alike. And they have all served to turn the moral flank of the opponent, opponents of change. Indeed, there would be truth, especially political truth, in the claim that the established church is the putative father of the permissive society. Now, calls for change, however, were set against a backdrop of increasing intolerance of homosexuals uh, by, the, um, uh, by the criminal law. There was approximately a fourfold increase from 1938 to 1955 in prosecutions for sodomy and bestiality, attempted sodomy, indecent assault, and gross indecency. The figure rose from uh, about 1,200 to about 5,500. The explanations for this increase are contested. Some people have accused the Home Secretary of the time, Sir David Maxwell Fife, uh, along with the Director of Public Prosecution, Sir Theobald, uh, Sir Theobald Matthew, and the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, Sir John Knott Bower, of orchestrating a kind of witch hunt against homosexuals. But others have shown that the most of the increase was in fact the result of more intense policing in three central London divisions. It's also feasible that the defection of Guy Burgess and Donald McLean uh, in um, uh, March 1951 might have rather changed the public mood. But what's undeniable for the discussion of homosexuality, at least in the kind of public sphere, was the impact of a number of high profile trials and the prurient press reports in the early 1950s. So the arrest of John Gilgood for importuning in 1953 and the trial of uh, Edward Montague, third Baron Montague of Beaulieu of the ancient of the vintage cars fame, as well as his cousin, the landowner Michael Pitt Rivers and Peter Wildblood, the Daily Mail journalist, all of those in 1954 uh, were uh, in, uh, uh, were uh, uh, charged uh, in uh, with for committing acts of indecency, and that caused uproar in the press and beyond. And in the end, Montague himself was sentenced to twelve months imprisonment, and Pitt Rivers and Wildblood to eighteen months each. Now that trial had far-reaching effects. On the one hand, uh, the trial included courtroom rhetoric, which emphasised all sorts of homosexual stereotypes as decadent, corrupt, effete and effeminate. 
as well as seeing them as traitors and corruptors of youth. So uh, the kind of uh, uh, stereotypes you get with Kenneth Williams and uh, Charles Hawtrey. Um, on the other hand, during the trial, a moral and loving form of homosexuality was contrasted with abnormal forms, which, uh, as Peter Wildblood observed of his own experience of the scandal and trial, could have little space for what he called the pathetically flamboyant pansy with the flapping wrists. Most of us, he went on, are not like that. We do our best to look like everyone else and we usually succeed. So homosexuality and homosexuals were increasingly normalized. They were just like any other people and were no longer identified simply with the rather countercultural and exotic queer world of particular professions and lifestyles or of men behaving as women and being given women's name, that kind of thing. Instead, homosexuality had become a condition which had very little to do with that sort of effeminacy, the kind of Kenneth Williams uh, uh, model. Now, what happens in the church is extremely interesting in relation to what's going on at the time. Now, as a result of the trials, there were many calls for reform, which eventually led to the establishment of a committee to examine and report on the criminal law on sexual offences, which was appointed by Maxwell Fife and by Sir Hugh Lucas Tooth, Under Secretary for the, at the Scottish Home Department. They had such great names. Even though the cabinet did not favour major reform of uh, sexual offences, it was widely recognised that the punishments and the policing weren't fit for purpose. Now, another really important factor in setting up the committee was the work of the Church of England Moral Welfare Council, Council and particularly uh, Derek Sherwin Bailey, a residential canon at Wells Cathedral, who worked as a lecturer uh, with the uh, Moral Welfare Council. Bailey soon became by far the most important church writer associated with the changing perceptions of homosexuality in the 1950s and his influence really spread far beyond the church. Now the Moral Welfare Council had mutated from the Church of England Purity Society that had been established at the end of the 19th century to oppose everything basically to oppose contraception and the use of prostitutes, as well as to promote personal sexual purity. By 1891, it had changed its name to the White Cross League, and by the 1920s, the various uh, Victorian charities were gradually coming under a single umbrella in the Archbishop's Advisory Board for Spiritual and Moral Work. Discussion of sex was beginning to become an increasingly important aspect of that work particularly in the light of contraception, particularly in the light of the massive increase in venereal disease during the First World War. Now, in 1928, the board expressed its conviction that the church needs to have sex matters more continuously under survey, and that's been true ever since. The board later became the Archbishop's Advisory Board for Preventive and Rescue Work, and then the Church of England Advisory Board for Moral Welfare Work. And in 1939, it amalgamated with the White Cross League to form the Moral Welfare Council. The language of the policing of morality and the promoting purity was thus changed to something rather more innocuous, to social welfare. The MWC changed its name again in 1961 to the Council for Social Work. Now what's clear is that new biological and psychological understandings of human nature were beginning to compliment, complicate the traditional understanding of sexual morality. Although the church continued to stand in opposition to greater permissiveness and liberalization of its own position on marriage, there was nonetheless an effort to understand as best possible and to engage with social changes as objectively as they possibly could. Now Bailey's works, uh, beginning with an article in the liberal Catholic journal Theology from 1952, called entitled The Problem of Sexual Inversion and followed by a book called The Mystery of Love and Marriage amount to the first Church of England uh, material devoted social, uh, solely to homosexuality, although it's unofficial, but because of his membership of the Moral Welfare Council, they took on a particular uh, hue 
Now, the theology article in 1952 was prompted by a letter from a, a man called Graham Dow. At the time, he was an ordinand at Ely Theological Con College, and he'd come from Hampstead, and later on in his career, he ended up as vicar of Hampstead. Now, in the January 1952 edition of Theology, he'd written a letter to uh, the editor, Alec Bidler, asking what the Christian conscious conscience acting under the charity and humanity as under the discipline and wisdom of the church has to say to the homosexual who wishes to be an active and healthy member of the Christian community. It was a challenge. His question pointed to the tensions which emerged in many of the later writings on homosexuality. Is homosexual concubinage, he said, to be treated purely and simple as an illicit union like fornication and, as the, and those who practice it to be judged as living in sin and to be deprived of the sacraments of the church? If so, what are we to say to those who profess to be congenitally homosexual? He went on to ask for a Christian discussion of the penal code and that the Christian conscience should distinguish between promiscuity and fidelity, between the balanced union and the vicious perversion, between in fact the invert and the pervert. Invert at the time was the word that was used very commonly by sexologists for homosexuals. What was the difference between the invert and the pervert? It should then examine both the justice and the expediency of a penal code which far from curing or determining, to deterring the homosexual has so often led to crime, particularly in the form of blackmail, to bravado or to the tragedy of wrecked lives. Now at Alec Bidler's request, at the editor's request, Derek uh, Sherwin Bailey uh, was uh, asked to respond to that challenge later on in the year. And Bailey argued for a calm approach to understanding the phenomenon of homosexuality. Although uh, the criminal penalties applied only to men, he also noted that it was a condition that was prevalent among women, one of the few discussions of female sexuality that one finds in the whole of the literature. Crucially, Bailey distinguished between what he called, in the language of the time, natural inverts and those who have acquired a homosexual character or who have become addicted to homosexual practices. Recognising that there was no simple explanation of the causes of the natural type of inversion and that it was impossible to find an adequate theological theory of sexual deviation, as he called it, he pointed out uh, as a logical consequence that it is clear that the innate invert ought not to be penalised on account of his condition. More importantly, however, he recognised that given this natural character of homosexuality, society should not ask something different of the homosexual than the heterosexual. Indeed, he went on, the intrusion into the privacy of the invert sexual life is not only grossly unfair, but itself conduces to crime. It is without doubt the Christian duty to press for the removal of this anomalous and shameful injustice, which has done untold harm and has achieved no good whatever. And it is to be hoped that those who look to the church for a lead in this matter will not be disappointed. His logic was really straightforward. If some homosexuality was a natural and innate condition, then it was wrong to criminalise homosexual acts. At the same time, he suggested that homosexual acts were not equivalent to what he called the union of marriage, which was dependent on sexual differentiation. That argument comes up over and over again. Now, while recognising that homosexual relationships might have elements of beauty and altruism, he nevertheless thought them quite different from intercourse between husband and wife. So he concludes that it was important to learn more about the condition as well as for the church to express its sympathy and guidance, which would then allow the homosexual to use his gifts better and to return to what he called normality. So although he adopts a pastoral and therapeutic approach, he also clearly identifies homosexuality as a natural condition which should not be penalised by the criminal law. Indeed, punishment in prison would be quite counterproductive. As you might expect, uh, his article in Theology provoked a very large number of letters. And something that might seem quite surprising 
uh, as he wrote uh, as he wrote later in the Moral Welfare Council submission of evidence to the committee chaired by Wolfenden, was that many in the church were concerned about the present law and its administration and anxious to know what pastoral help could be given to the homosexual. And the theology article led directly to the setting up of a small group of Anglican clergymen and medical practitioners to study homosexuality, which produced a short report uh, called The Problem of Homosexuality, uh, an interim report. And that became absolutely integral to the Wolfenden report later. Now, Maxwell Fife, the Home Secretary, regarded homosexuals as exhibitionists and proselytizers, and he had very little desire to reform uh, for reform whatsoever. But he was very keen to read the church's report because he thought it might come up with some very sensible recommendations. Now, the problem of homosexuality, uh, which was published or at least printed in January 1954, was not intended to be circulated to the public, which might uh, explain the relative frankness of its discussions. But in the end, copies were sent to theological college principals, as well as to diocesan bishops, parliamentarians and many others, which meant that very quickly its conclusions uh, were very widely known. It made a very great impact on the subsequent history of decriminalisation and provoked 1,500 or more responses. It was an important factor of the addition of the subject of homosexuality to that of prostitution for discussion by the Wolfenden Committee. Initially, it was only to be about uh, 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 prostitution. Now, the problem of homosexuality, which was drafted by Bailey, follows a very similar line to his theology article in distinguishing the invert from the pervert, uh, and um, uh, it also seeing uh, the importance of understanding homosexuality as a condition, a human condition. Uh, now, although a number of uh, psychological explanations are proposed uh, to the call as to the causes of homosexuality, especially uh, as is very common at the time, uh, an unsatisfactory parental relationship, the report nevertheless suggests that inversion is a condition that cannot be altered since there's no therapy. Principally for this reason, it calls for decriminalization. So the church is recommending decriminalization of homosexuality. Nevertheless, it's clear as well that the church shouldn't be adapting its teachings, and it was absolutely unequivocal in continuing to regard homosexuality as a sin. Homosexual acts are sins against God, it said, whether or not they are crimes against the state. So there's a separation between sin and crime. Now, the argument for sinfulness was based on the common idea of homosexual as involving the unnatural use of non complementary organs. Once again, uh, that becomes important in the argument. I think it's still uh, being made, probably in LLF as well. Christian inverts should consequently seek to accept their condition and by seeking to sublimate their sexual lives in socially useful ways, achieve personal fulfillment. That's all that's left to be done. Now, perhaps rather naively, the report suggests in all cases of homosexuality, the teacher should teach habits of self-control. It will stress the unnaturalness of homosexual physical intercourse and more important still, help them to face their condition and sublimate or transmute their homosexual drives through prayer and imagination into creative and socially acceptable service, such as youth leadership. Now, this understanding of homosexuality as a sin meant that the problem of homosexuality, which really resembles every uh, uh, later or most later uh, discussions of homosexuality, especially issues in human sexuality, it means there's always a kind of double edged conclusion. So the questions that that Ordinan Dowell had asked in his original letter, is homosexual concubinage to be judged as living in sin, had been answered. The invert is exempt from being judged for his homosexual condition, which is morally neutral, but at the same time, he cannot be absolved from responsibility from immoral homosexual practices. So for Bailey, even if homosexuality were to be decriminalized, it would nevertheless still present a social problem and will be a sign of the breakdown of marriage and family life, which were required to sustain human relations. So the main task for Christians was consequently to improve family life 
so that homosexuality does not happen in the first place. But his overall conclusion is simple. What people did in private, provided it didn't involve children or young adults, should not be a criminal offence, even though it remained a sin in the eyes of the church. So the problem of homosexuality, an official church report proposes decriminalization as a means which would help homosexuals find more equal relations rather than having to have illicit liaisons. Now, all of that was an enormous bombshell to a conservative government. And some people at the time found that position taken by the church completely unexpected. So Peter Wildblood, uh, Wildblood one of the imprisoned men, was later to reflect, this pamphlet must have come as a considerable shock to those state officials who were now in full cry after Edward Montague cutting as it did uh, the moral ground from under their feet. It surprised me too. I'd always thought of the church as the last stronghold of prejudice and had never found an occasion for praising it for its moral courage in controversial matters. Yet here from church house came an attack on the law which was as broad-minded, clear-headed and brilliantly argued as one could wish. It was all the more surprising because the English laws against homosexuality were religious in origin and widely held to represent the views of the church. Now, in the debates in Parliament surrounding the setting up of the Wolfenden Committee, Russell Barry, Bishop of Southall, acted as the chief spokesman for the church and adopted almost an identical line to the problem of homosexuality. There was nothing wrong with being homosexual. It was a condition like colour blindness or paralysis that was used in parliamentary debate that simply happens to a man. Nevertheless, while this demanded sympathy and understanding in the treatment of the homosexual, it did not allow for acts that he called a violation of the natural law. And what's absolutely fascinating in all the arguments at the time, not a single use is made, or at least that I found, uh, of the Bible. All of that clobber stuff that comes later simply isn't used. It's all about natural law. So all this meant was in the arguments that were used was that homosexuality was a natural condition that, that some form of uh, uh, physical handicap, that was the normal way they expressed it, and was not something that was freely chosen. Shortly after the publication uh, of The Problem of Homosexuality, Bailey himself went on to write uh, an extraordinarily important book called Homosexuality in the Western Christian Tradition, which is still uh, really uh, the magnum opus, his magnum opus, and still uh, the most impressive study of uh, the overview of homosexuality with the whole uh, of the understanding through the Western Church. And that also was submitted to the Wolfenden Committee and it helped them understand how Christians had related to homosexuality right through. Um, what was important was that all of this fed in to the Wolfenden Report and changed the kind of moral tone. Um, for the Christian homosexual, and for the most part, lesbianism simply isn't mentioned. It's not seen as a problem, chiefly because it had never uh, been subject to the criminal law. Always there is the sense that uh, um, uh, celibacy is the only option that's left for those who are uh, homosexual if they are to remain uh, as Christians. But at the same time, there is also in that promotion of celibacy something that's quite important. There's also that sense that it creates uh, amongst a certain institutional uh, uh, um, form a kind of accommodation of homosexual, homosexuals where inverts, as they were called, whose condition is seen as natural, could find status in a kind of loving community. Celibacy was often associated with Christian ministry, uh, even uh, at that stage. Now, in Bailey's work, which shapes, as I say, the official policy of the Church of England for very many years, there is an inherent tension. On the one hand, Bailey offers a psychological explanation of the homosexual as somebody who's not responsible for his or her own condition. It's completely natural uh, and should thus not be punished by the law. But on the other hand, Bailey asserts the traditional Christian position, which is based on a different understanding of what is natural. Human relationships require two complementary sexes given as a creation ordinance. So there's that tension in an understanding of what is actually natural, two different conceptions of nature 
one scientific, one Christian, are consequently operative in Bailey's work, two competing versions of what nature is all about. And at the very least, that creates a serious tension in subsequent work on homosexuality in the church. So let me just uh, move on very briefly, uh, just to look and see what happens uh, in the next uh, uh, 10 years before we open up to a bit of a discussion. Uh, now, the submission of the Moral Welfare Council to the Wolfenden Committee, uh, which was called Sexual Offenders and Social Punishment, was also drafted by uh, Derek Sherwin Bailey and moved in much the same direction as his earlier work, uh, importantly maintaining that distinction between private and public, as well as between sin and crime. Law shouldn't be about safeguarding private morality or shielding the mature citizen from the temptation uh, to do wrong. And interestingly, it also argues on the basis of equality of treatment between men and women. It doesn't condone lesbianism, but it does say that lesbians remain completely outside the criminal law and men should be treated in the same way. Uh, it would therefore bring about an increase of justice. And the overall approach uh, is something that really finds its way into the Wolfen Committee's uh, proposals. Wolfenden, after all, is a regular communicant, uh, an Anglican, uh, and a regular correspondent with bishops and senior church leaders. Now, after the publication of the Wolfenden Report in 1957, the church assembly debates the recommendations with a motion that asks for general approval of the decriminalization of homosexual acts in private. Uh, and the arguments that were used uh, by the Bishop of Exeter who proposed the motion uh, maintains very much the same kind of distinctions that you find in Bailey's work. Uh, others went further, so the Vicar of All Saints Margaret Street, uh, Kenneth Ross, pointed out that because uh, there were probably as many as half a million people regularly committing homosexual acts, he thought, that it was quite inequitable to maintain the current law. Uh, I've managed to find two speeches uh, by laymen uh, which adopted biblical arguments uh, against change. But the motion passed uh, by 155 votes against 138, so relatively uh, by a relatively narrow margin, but it still passes. Uh, and that meant uh, that um, what Bailey thought would happen, which was that the church assembly would disown the Wolfenden report, proved quite the opposite. And it's interesting in Scotland, the Church of Scotland uh, voted against uh, the uh, Wolfenden report and homosexuality remained a crime for significantly longer uh, in Scotland. Uh, that said, some church leaders, including Christopher Chavas, uh, the Evangelical Bishop of Rochester, distanced themselves from the Church of England's submission. And later in the next few years, the beginning of the 1960s, there is a clawing back a little bit of where things have got to. But by the 1960s, uh, and Michael Ramsey's appointment as Archbishop of Canterbury meant that things moved on really quite fast. Uh, he took a sympathetic position, uh, liaising with backbenchers, promoting uh, the decriminalisation legislation. The church at the time was still very much in the forefront of society. What the church said was still listened to by the wider society, but also importantly uh, by Parliament as well. It's also clear from archival work that many who spoke in favour of reform were reluctant to do so, and some of the confessions were prompted by the episcopate. Uh, many people felt rather anxious about speaking out uh, in favour of uh, homosexuality. But some things were also pressed by the episcopate. A higher age of consent and a strict definition of private uh, were also pressed. So there is an ambiguity about the way the bishops behave, but certainly it would never probably have gone through without the support uh, of the Church of England, which was still considered as the kind of moral backbone uh, to England. So speaking in the House of Lords debate in 1965, Michael Ramsey continues in much the same way as everything that had gone before. I believe that homosexuality, homosexual acts are always wrong in the sense that they use in the wrong way human organs for which the right use is intercourse between men and women within marriage. Amidst the modern talk about the new morality, I would uphold the belief that just as fornication is always wrong, so homosexual acts are always wrong, that fornication is not against the law. Uh, 
So when the Sexual Offences Bill finally passed into law in July 1967, after the change of government, or at least after the increase of the Labour majority, and through the continuing work of lobbying organisations uh, like the Homosexual Law Reform Society, Michael Ramsey wrote to the Earl of Arran, expressing his heartfelt congratulations. In 1969, the Church Assembly organised a questionnaire of 736 members on attitudes towards homosexuality, which pointed to a split between approximately 51% of people saying that homosexual behaviour between consenting adults was always sinful, with about 34% answering uh, uh, no that it was, could at times be regarded as, as, as not simple. But the Board of Respo Social Responsibility as well had appointed a group to review the situation in the light of the Wolfenden Report and the, the, uh, the decriminalisation, uh, which failed to reach a unified view about the acceptability of homosexuality. So by July 1970, uh, there is uh, the, um, it was never published, but there was uh, a report called Homosexuality, a Review of the Situation, which for the first time in any of the church literature came up with the idea that it might be feasible to think of an alternative to celibacy. So on the one hand, it said, we can carry on with the traditional view of chastity and singleness, or on the other hand, although they said, a homosexual relationship could never be as fully human, as satisfactory for a human being as a heterosexual relationship. Nevertheless, it may be the best relationship that is possible for a person of an exclusive and fixed homosexual disposition. In such a case, a homosexual relationship is not sinful. It may be a right relationship for the parties concerned if it is the best they can achieve. They can achieve. In 1970, a statement like that coming from the church is a radical statement indeed. Now that report remains confidential, but for the first time there is that expression of the possibility that it may be that homosexual activity could be seen as acceptable. Might fail to live up to the ideal, but nevertheless, it could be a possibility. But I think, uh, and I'm going to end here, 1967 also marks the beginning of some of the most significant internal changes within the Church of England. 67 is the date of the Kiel Conference of Anglican Evangelicals, where they decide that they're going to participate fully within the structures of the Church of England. Society is also changing. The influence of the church uh, and public life is becoming uh, less and less central to activity. So on the one hand, you've got a changing, uh, if you like, uh, leadership, uh, beginnings of change of leadership within the church. On the other hand, we've got uh, changes in society. And in that kind of context, new campaigns begin to emerge. Most importantly, the nationwide festival of light. Um, let me just, missed a couple there, but uh, I thought it, it can't be right not to have a picture of Mary Whitehouse and a talk about sex in the 1960s and 70s. They publish a book in 1975 called The Truth in Love, and that suggests that homosexual activity was found nowhere in nature except in sexually stunted human beings and in certain animals under conditions of extreme stress. The tone, the rhetoric of the debate is changing quite markedly by that stage. Uh, at the end of the 1970s, there's an altercation uh, uh, between the National Festival of Light and uh, the gay Christian movement, which was set up uh, in that same period. Uh, and there is um, uh, a, a kind of real strong uh, uh, battle, if you like, uh, that takes place at All Souls uh, Langham Place. What happens? begins to uh, polarise the debate. And those changes that have emerged at the end of the 1960s begin to get redrawn into something altogether very different uh, against a backdrop uh, of massive changes uh, to society at the beginning of the 1980s. And that's where uh, Jane Shaw is going to take over uh, in a couple of weeks time. I'll leave you uh, with uh, Mary Whitehouse and the gay news
the blasphemous libel case, uh, the publication of James Kirkup's poem, the, Dove, the Love That Dares Not Speak Its Name. The polarization happens, the church moves away from being in the vanguard to being on the defensive. So there, I'll, uh, I'll finish. I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, uh, Robert will um, tell us what to do next.